<laughs> stop, stop. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are so kind. Thank you so much. I want to welcome you uh, to Montgomery. I want to welcome you to the Justice Summit. We are so thrilled that you are here. We're so thrilled that we are going to have two days of amazing conversations from the most woke people in America. How about that? <laughs> And I'm delighted to uh, start this first session with three extraordinary people. He is the Lippmann Professor of Journalism at Columbia University, an award-winning writer and journalist uh, for The New Yorker and other publications. Our moderator for this morning, the extraordinary Jelani Cobb. She is the amazing writer, thinker, intellect who started a movement that has shaken this country, the extraordinary author of the new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander. my dear, dear friend, and the president counsel, director counsel uh, of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the author of the groundbreaking breaking book, On the Courthouse Lawn, which was the genesis of so much of the work that we are doing on lynching, the extraordinary, brilliant Sherilyn Eiffel. fortunate man in Alabama today. <laughs> uh, I get to have uh, this conversation with these uh, two brilliant women whose uh, work I've admired uh, for so long. Uh, and so I think we'll just kind of jump in and talk about this moment that we're in and, and how we got to it. And I have not gotten a chance to see the memorial yet. Uh, I'm going there from here. Uh, but just the work that, uh, that Brian has done and that EJI has done in excavating this part of the past that the country has no interest in confronting unless they're, they're pushed to do so. And uh, from the work that both of you do, we know that there are very deep roots, historical roots in how we got to this moment. So I just wanna start with a kind of general question, which is how did we get here? Well, I, I'll just start first by saying how thrilled I am to be here and what an extraordinary moment this is that we're in, gathered here to celebrate this extraordinary museum and all of the work um, that has gone into it. Um, this work of remembrance, the insistence on the importance of memory, I think, is a critical part of birthing a new nation. Um, last night, you know, I was able to attend this extraordinary celebration, and over and over, I heard people talking about the importance of truth and reconciliation. Kim Taylor Thompson and Brian Stevenson last night both emphasize that we can't have reconciliation without truth, and that we have been mm. unwilling to face the truth in this country. And there have been many activists and scholars, probably most notably ta Coates, who has made the point that perhaps reconciliation isn't possible without 
reparation, without mm -hmm. some attempt to repair the harm of the past. But you know, as I was preparing to come here, as I was journeying here, I kept thinking that beyond truth, beyond reconciliation, even beyond <coughs> reparation, part of what is happening here is the birth of a new nation, that we're at a time in our history when Confederate statues are coming down and new statues museums are coming up. <laughs> and that this isn't just the work of making a more perfect union since our union was never perfect. It isn't about just improving this nation that this is the work of birthing a new nation. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. part of that river that Dr. Vincent Harding talked about, mm -hmm. this river of rebellion and resistance and remaking of a nation um, that has yet to be. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I just want to say at this outset how thrilled I am to be here with so many people mm -hmm. committed to being part of that rebirth. And certainly by now, I think we understand the price, the cost of mm -hmm. not remembering, mm -hmm. of color blindness, of looking away, of mm -hmm. sweeping history under the rug, of attempting to move on uh, without facing the truth, without telling the truth. And we see now that if we fail to face our history, if we fail to tell the truth, we will repeat it. Um, like a child who will just keep sticking their hand in a fire because they do not remember the hurt of the pain if they have no memory. We as our nation, our collective subconscious, as well as all of those who are intent on preserving white supremacy and racial hierarchy, will rebirth these systems of racial and social control over and over again. And as Brian Stevenson has eloquently stated, you know, slavery didn't die, it evolved. And part of the work we have today is putting slavery, the mindset that birthed slavery, the political and economic forces that gave rise to slavery, allowing that to die and grieving those who were lost and participating in the revolutionary birth of a new nation. That's something that Dr. King understood at the end of his life when he said we need a revolution of values. Mm -hmm. He wasn't talking about a rhetorical revolution, he was talking about an actual revolution, the restructuring of our political and economic systems so that a new nation could be born, America must be born again. And I think we are here today we got to this place um, because for too long, our nation hasn't been willing to face its history. But this museum, all of you present here, is more than enough evidence that I think we're ready to rise to the challenge this moment in history presents. Sure. So first of all, this is um, so deeply moving, so extraordinary to be here, to see all of you, to, um, to really see what Brian and his team have created. I'm so proud of him and, um, and feel that this is such an important moment, especially at this moment in this country, to be doing this project that Michelle is just talking about. Um, this year is the 150th anniversary of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. And um, we had a conference earlier this week in Philadelphia and we had a whole panel on Reconstruction. And just talking about what happened in Reconstruction, what, what, what got papered over, what got turned, the compromises that were made, the stories that were created to explain what the Confederacy was, mm -hmm. um, the kinds of lies that became part of the national story in that period. And how much we are still dealing with the consequence mm -hmm. of the decisions that were made during that period. And my engagement with this issue of lynching really compelled me to think about this question of remembering because I found that I was in my work as a young civil rights lawyer at the Legal Defense Fund constantly bumping into this history in communities where I was litigating cases. I'd be litigating a voting rights case 
as I was in Oklahoma in 1991. And part of litigating these cases requires you to present evidence about the history of discrimination in that community. And that was when I first learned about the Tulsa race riots. Mm. Um, it was these stories that African Americans would tell me about some racial pogrom, some, mm -hmm. some lynching, some act of violence that happened in the past that for them was a defining moment in the history of that community. And when I moved and started doing work in Maryland, and I started working on a case involving transportation access, I asked about the history of discrimination and I learned from those conversations about two lynchings that happened in the 1930s in those communities. Couldn't find any evidence that they happened, but there were these very detailed stories about these events. And I started that project of trying to ex excavate that history. And in 2003, I wrote an article called Creating a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Lynching. I had been to South Africa. I had heard whatever were the flaws, the um, honesty of a conversation about race that I had never heard in this country. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't understand how to reconcile the silence that I found in the communities where I was working around these events that were so defining and the very explicit conversation about the worst kinds of atrocities that occurred in South Africa. And I felt that this was missing, that we had papered over something that could not be papered over. And that in fact, the work I was doing in litigating cases in, my con in the contemporary moment had everything to do with those two men who were killed in 1931 and 1933 um, in those communities. And so I started writing about it and it led to the book I wrote on the courthouse lawn confronting the legacy of lynching in the 21st century. I was essentially mm -hmm. saying, what does what all, all these events that happened in the 20th century, what do they have to do with the 21st century? And what they had to do with it was that they lived on in these communities, you know? Um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, the past does not lay down quietly. It does not lay down <laughs> quietly. Uh, it, 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 it exists in the relationships that became frozen. These were terrible, terrible incidents that happened in these communities, a, a absolute betrayal of the justice system um, in which you know, people all over the community were complicit in witnessing these events, in which men were railroaded and accused of the worst crimes that they did not commit, in which families were in some instances so afraid that they wouldn't even come and collect the bodies of their lo loved ones, in which um, communities were terrorized by the presentation of lynching victims. I mean, this was a message crime that terrorized communities. And that message was received mm -hmm. by those communities. Mm -hmm. And that message still lived on, even when I was visiting those communities in the 1990s and in the early aughts, and still to this day. So until we go back and recognize what happened, talk about what happened, and um, unsend that message, you know how on a computer you try to get a message back mm -hmm. <laughs> that you send, it's really hard. Um, we, we need to do that project. And, you know, and I'll say in the, in the book that I wrote, I said this needs to happen in the black and the white community. Mm -hmm. Because um, this, is, this is their role in, in lynching actually continues to resonate today as well. And it, and it resonates in what we see in the, in the criminal justice system and what we see in the kinds of ways in which stories are told about who perpetrators are and who victims are and who law enforcement is and when, when you can question law enforcement and when you can't. Um, that that's, we inherited that and they inherited that. And so we need to go back and excavate that. Mm -hmm. I think that um, one of the things, when, when I was in graduate school and uh, I was reading and, and writing about lynching, uh, one of the things that struck me was the number, and that number has grown. Mm -hmm. You know, Tuskegee uh, mm -hmm. began, when it was still Tuskegee Institute, began keeping track of lynchings, and their number came out to about, is there some Tuskegee people here? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> And um, we could do a whole HBCU shout out roll call here <laughs> in a second. Double time. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Although if I did do that, I'd be sure to mention Howard where I went. But I won't do that. <laughs> but but in, in uh, looking at the work that Tuskegee did, yeah. and they came out around 3,000, mm -hmm. <laughs> around 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. Oh, did Jesse Jackson just say A&T? Yeah. <laughs> 
this conversation has gone way yes. less. Yes. <laughs> but, but the work that, uh, that Tuskegee did, they had a number around 3,000, yeah. and the number has kind of gone up to when I was in graduate school, it was 37, 3,800. Mm -hmm. Now people are thinking that it's in the 5,000 range. And one of the uh, kind of stunning aspects of this is that when you look at it, it averaged out to about two to three lynchings per week mm -hmm. over the course of three decades. And that's just the kind of middle part of the bell curve. There's a smaller distribution at the beginning and a smaller distribution um, at the end, so it doesn't, it doesn't end there. And so this is kind of deeply in, interred in American history. Uh, and for the work that we do in the present, mm -hmm. uh, and you are in the new Jim Crow and uh, lecturing and, and talking about these issues and with the LDF, it seems possible to see the fingerprints of that when we look at things like Stefan Clark or Philando Castile, or the entire litany, uh, Sandra Bland, the entire litany of uh, these high-profile instances we've seen of black people uh, losing their lives uh, at the hands of law enforcement in these ways that um, should not happen. And I wonder if it's, it's too much to say that lynching is foundational to the relationship of African Americans and criminal justice. No, I, I don't think that's... <laughs> it's not too much. Um, go, no, go ahead. No, go. Well, I, I just... It goes right to the beginning of the uh, statement you just made about the number and how the number, uh, you know, has increased as we've delved more. The, 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 the most important connection, first and foremost, is with this question of truth and what is truth. Because there was a very deliberate effort to cover the truth about lynching. It's not as though many of you don't know bec by accident. <laughs> you don't know because when lynchings happened, there was a silence that fell and there was a compact within communities, particularly white communities, that you didn't talk about it. In black communities, very often it was not talked about anymore because of fear. Um, but in the white community, it also wasn't talked about because they, of fear because they wanted to protect one another. And that extended to actual institutions. I mean, in the lynchings that I studied, you know, the, the one in 1931, the local newspaper did not cover the lynching that happened in front of 500 people on a Friday night at eight o'clock. And what they said, the newspaper came out the next day and it said, it issued a statement. And the statement said, we will not report on the demonstration that occurred last night for the mm. simple reason that everyone knows what happened. Mm. Right? Mm. So the deliberate attempt to, to cover this up and then to pretend kind of that it didn't happen um, and it was really those black institutions like Tuskegee, it was black journalists like Ida B. Wells Barnett. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, was, it was the work that they did to keep these accounts alive that is the work that EJI has built on mm -hmm. and now has recognized how high that number is. I've always said nearly 5,000 because there's so many unrecorded lynchings. Mm -hmm. But the reality is the black community had to fight to keep this history alive. And what that has to do with today is that the reason that we are calling out the names of the people that you're calling out is because we have these videos. Mm -hmm. Most people in this room know that the issue of police violence against unarmed African Americans is not new. It is not new anywhere in this country. I'm, I'm originally from New York and I can remember being 10 years old and at NYPD killing another 10-year-old, Clifford Glover, mm -hmm. when I was 10. Mm -hmm. so, so this is not um, new. But we didn't have the videos and so we were gaslighted in the same way. Right? Did it happen? He reached for his band. He had a gun. He was a thief. He was, all, all of the stories that used to cover all of this and that they still try to perpetrate. But now you can't unsee Walter Scott running in that park and being shot in the back. You can't unsee Eric Garner being choked to death um, by, the, by the NYPD. And so that connection first and foremost, there are many others, but that connection of just truth of, of gaslighting the black community into believing that something that is part of their experience didn't happen mm -hmm. is one of the first connections and one of the most powerful ones because it creates a sense of uncertainty within our own community and then it also allowed white people to say it didn't happen that way mm -hmm. and to own truth. Mm -hmm. And that is evident right now in the struggle over data. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's stunning that there is no national system for collecting data mm. on police shootings. Mm -hmm. You know, you ask the Justice Department how many unarmed black men have been killed in a particular year, and they can't give you mm -hmm. um, a clear answer. And many police departments around the country have not collected 
the kind of data that would allow people to you know, even report um, accurate numbers. Um, the Guardian, as well as other you know, media outlets have undertaken efforts um, to collect that kind of data, but it's a reflection of whose lives matter, whose lives and deaths are worth counting and keeping track of. And years ago, um, police departments claimed that you know, racial profiling was mm -hmm. a figment of the collective imagination mm -hmm. of black and brown people and refused to collect data on the race and ethnicity of people who were stopped and mm -hmm. searched. So when, you know, someone would say, you know, I was, you know, stopped for no reason other than my, my race, my car was pulled over, I was beat up, I was first, I was thrown to the pavement, and this is happening to me because I'm black. You know, the police department said, no, there's no such thing as racial profiling. All groups mm -hmm. are treated equally, mm -hmm. and there was no data, no way to prove mm -hmm. it. Um, and so this, this struggle, um, for data and memory and the counting and the recording is just a part of the effort um, to count every life and to honor it as though it matters. And uh, I hope that as we move forward that not only will we continue to count those um, who were lynched, um, but we will demand a much better accounting of those who are being lynched in the modern age mm -hmm. um, by our police departments and, you know, our, our law enforcement today. Mm -hmm. Jel Jelani, can I, just, can I just add, I just want to add something about the, you know, because you talked about the criminal justice system and, and the question of just the justice apparatus itself. Um, because think about, if you think about the choreography of lynching, um, a black person is accused of doing something. Um, and, 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 and it wasn't always that black men were accused of raping white women. Even mm -hmm. Ida B. Wells Barnett, in her accounting, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, recognized mm -hmm. that that was not the principal reason that mm -hmm. even, even people were accused of, of, of committing a crime. Um, so you have that, they're accused of something. Then you have the actual killing, right? It's a, it's a mob, it's two or three people, or it's thousands. Sometimes the person, the African-American person is dragged from jail. Sometimes they're taken from their home. What, whatever is the, the means, and they are killed. And, and that killing has some public dimension, which is kind of what makes it a lynching, right? You're not trying to hide it, it's a message crime. So you're hanging the body, you're burning the body, you're dragging the body through the streets, you're leaving the body on the black side of town. You want to send the message. Um, now what happens? What should happen is there should be an apparatus of investigation and prosecution of those who committed this terrible crime, mm -hmm. right? And we know that that doesn't happen. We know that we don't have any accounting of anyone who was convicted of actual murder for lynching someone. Some people were convicted of riot and other things. So that means that there's a, a breakdown in the justice system. And so you have to be looking at the role of those local prosecutors who should have been conducting investigations and those local police who did not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are cases of prosecutors who, um, first of all, there's complicity in the community. You know, our, our, there's the famous quote of one man who said, you know, we would never testify and say what we saw because we're all uh, neighbors and neighbors' neighbors, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, they, so there's the closed ranks of the community that won't tell. There's the failure of the police to actually conduct real investigations. But there's a story to be told about the role that local prosecutors played in refusing to seriously try and prosecute the lynchers, even though everybody knew who they were. There are very few masked lynchings, right? That is, the people who committed these crimes, they were not scared. They did not have on masks. Everyone knew who they were, and yet somehow you didn't have these prosecutions happen. Um, I know of at least one case in which the state attorney general uh, took over and actually provided the local prosecutor with affidavits of the, with the, with the identities of all the lynchers and the local prosecutor still refused to bring that prosecution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this question of um, prosecutors, which we've all been talking about quite a bit, mm -hmm. and this question of accountability for killing, um, particularly in the context of law enforcement, is another piece that is inherited and another piece that I think links us to this period, that in every moment of the justice system, there has to be either action or failure to act. Mm -hmm. And th as much as we're making the demands for truth and data, we also have to be making the demands that the actors in the criminal justice system act as they are supposed to act, as they are charged to act um, in a way that, that vindicates the lives of those people who are killed um, unlawfully. I'm glad you raised the issue of accountability uh, because that's where I wanted to go next. Uh, in, 
in terms of the present administration and the present DOJ and the present concerns uh, around uh, issues of criminal justice, uh, the introductory statement of the Sessions DOJ was to get rid of the consent decrees uh, that had been used uh, for, to bring uh, rogue police departments uh, more closely into line with what the actual standards were supposed to be. And uh, in some instances, police departments themselves wanted to have uh, this oversight that would help them develop better practices or come closer to best practices. And the DOJ said that we're no longer uh, interested. And I think even raised the question of whether uh, there even is uh, systemic wrongdoing in any police department in the United States. Uh, and so I wondered from your perspectives, you know, what does the, the current lay of the land in terms of criminal justice uh, and efforts at criminal justice reform look like? Uh, what are sort of some of the things that we should be concerned about that's happening, uh, that are happening under the, the Sessions DOJ? Well, um... <laughs> <laughs> be delicate. I'll keep this brief because I do not want to give him that much air time today. Uh, Jeff Sessions um, came into this office, shockingly came into this office, um, uh, son of Alabama, with a very clear idea about law enforcement and a very clear idea about what he wanted to accomplish. There is no fact about the reality of the criminal justice system that will change his mind, including about policing. Um, I, I met with him only once, uh, and in that meeting, I, uh, I was really fighting for this cold consent decree process. We had a pending consent decree in Baltimore, there's one in Ferguson, we wanted this pattern and practice investigations to continue, and, um, and it was clear that he was not for it. Even though the police chief of Baltimore was saying, we want this consent decree, even though law enforcement themselves was saying, this actually helps us, it gives us more resources and so forth. So he just was not going to have it. Um, and if you'll notice, you know, the, the conversation at the federal level about criminal justice reform um, has completely shifted with this new administration. In the, in the prior administration, there actually was a bipartisan effort to um, pass a criminal justice reform bill. Both Republicans and Democrats were on board. In many ways, I didn't think that it went far enough, but it was an attempt to begin to do something around sentencing and particularly black and brown people who were subjected to overly harsh sentences in uh, drug cases in the federal system. And it was supposed to make some changes to that. The whole conversation about criminal justice reform has now been turned into a conversation about prison reform and about creating reentry programs. And while I believe strongly in the importance of reentry programs, it is the height of cynicism to be Jeff Sessions, who has removed all of the smart on crime efforts that Attorney General Holder first imposed so that you wouldn't overcharge defendants and so forth. Uh, and so he's shoveling people into the criminal justice system as fast as he can. And then, and then we're supposed to be excited about a program, a reentry program on the way out. Mm -hmm. None of us would want that for our kids. None of us want a program on the way out after our kids have been in jail for 15 and 20 years. That's not the... So, so I would just say, just, be, just beware when you, when you, if you right now leave and you Google, you're gonna see that there's a prison reform bill that they are um, talking about. And you'll also see that every civil rights organization opposes the bill. This is the, this is the, the cynically morphed thing that they created so that there's no real federal criminal justice reform uh, but now there's just this prison reform. And of course, the federal system is just a, a fraction of the criminal justice system, which is really operated at the state level. And so we're continuing to do really intense local work. But, but this is really important to see this hijacked and to see um, members of Congress pretend as though creating reentry programs is the same as, as not taking away people's lives on the front end is just uh, very indicative of the moment that we're in. Mm -hmm. I agree 100% with that. I think the only thing I would add is kind of where you left off, mm -hmm. which is that this system of mass incarceration is not primarily a system of federal mm -hmm. incarceration. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we seize this mm -hmm. moment as an opportunity to get very serious about building this movement state by state, mm -hmm. county by county, city by city. That's it. Um, and you know, not expect mm -hmm. it to be a problem that can be fixed mm -hmm. at the top with reform trickling mm -hmm. all the way trickling down. down. Mm -hmm. And 
You know, I think back to the time when the civil rights movement, the black, mm -hmm. black freedom struggle mm -hmm. was building. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, you had several membership-based mm -hmm. grassroots organizations that were focused like a laser on ending Jim Crow segregation. Mm -hmm. You had the Congress on Racial Equality, which had 50-some mm -hmm. chapters mm -hmm. around the country. You had SNCC, mm -hmm. you had the NAACP, you had the Southern Christian Leadership mm -hmm. Conference. These were membership-based organizations that were perceived as radical, radical. organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, these were not mainstream organizations that had a seat at the table and were regularly invited to the White House mm -hmm. and expert briefings and conferences. Mm -hmm. These were considered fringe mm -hmm. radical organizations where you could risk your life even having your name mm -hmm. on the membership roll, and yet you had thousands of people, um, members of these organizations, engaged in direct action, community organizing, movement building, in most of the states in this country. And I think there's a temptation to want to believe that the crisis that we're facing today will require something less. Mm -hmm. That there That's are right. technocratic solutions that if we get the right experts mm -hmm. in the room, mm -hmm. you know, we can tinker with this machine and get it right. But I firmly believe that just as ending lynching and ending the old Jim Crow required a radical grassroots movement that you know, in which people across lines of race and ethnicity and class join together to shake the foundations of a system. That is the kind of movement and commitment and risk taking and boldness and daring that is required of us now. And I think it's connected to this Trump moment. You know, I, I've I've said a number of times that, you know, I have some difficulty with us framing ourselves as being part of a resistance. Because as I see it, Trump and company are the resistance. <laughs> there is a bold new America mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. begging to be born, struggling to be born as part of that river of, you know, cour courageous activism from the days of abolition mm -hmm. on down of a new America struggling to be born. And it's beautiful to see it blooming in so many ways with LGBTQ rights, with the Dreamers, with the Movement for Black Lives, for Standing Rock and Occupy. You see this extraordinary energy mm -hmm. in the United States struggling to birth this new America. Um, and Trump is the resistance. They see this new America being born and go back. Mm -hmm. Let's stop that mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. And so let's use this moment uh, with Trump in office and with the federal government more or less on mm -hmm. lockdown mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to focus our energies in our own communities, mm -hmm. in our schools, our towns, our counties, mm -hmm. our cities, our states and build this movement from the ground, the ground up, up so that no matter who is in office, they will have no choice but to deal with the movement that has been born. Um, there's a, a, another part of this conversation that I want to um, talk about as well, uh, which is that in, in the discussions of lynching, uh, we typically, uh, very many people, I guess most people don't even know uh, for reasons of commission and omission uh, that, the, that this is the ancestral legacy of the United States. Uh, but to the extent that we do discuss it, we often think of it in terms of black men uh, explicitly and singularly. And there is this tradition of violence directed at black women as well. Um, this, yes. the, well-known uh, among, among people who discuss uh, these sort of things and research these things, the lynching of Mary Turner, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, pregnant black woman who's lynched in, in Georgia in a horrific way, mm -hmm. and uh, the whole litany of, uh, of acts of violence that are visited upon black women as well. And in the contemporary conversation around criminal justice reform, uh, we have to kind of uh, remind people to go back to that conversation as well. And so I wondered if we could talk just a little bit about 
uh, the ways of, of that legacy of lynching and violence directed at women of color, specifically black women, uh, and the connection of where uh, women of color, particularly black women, are in the criminal justice system right now? Well, this week is, a, is an important um, moment to be talking about this. Um, you know, I think many of us have seen the video of what happened to Ms. Clemens in the Waffle House and how she was treated uh, by police officers. And I was telling my team that when I saw their um, indifference to uh, her nakedness on the top, you know, her, her breast being born, it reminded me of Fannie Lou Hamer mm -hmm. and her account of being beaten mm -hmm. and how she mm -hmm. tried to keep her dress down. Mm -hmm. um, this assault on the dignity of black women mm -hmm. should not be uh, dismissed either. You mm -hmm. know, when we talk about lynching, we're talking about people who were killed, but, the, but assault and assaults on dignity were a key part of the way black women were and are engaged um, around white supremacy. I, I do want to say a word about this in the, in the connection with lynching, um, because, you know, there's Mary Turner, and there are others, very often um, women who, historic, who were lynched in this historical kind of lynching period were the, were the relatives of men who got into some altercation. Um, and so the mother who tries to save her son or her husband or tries to spirit uh, her relative out of town, uh, the sister, um, is often, um, you know, the, the woman who is, who is lynched alongside men in her family. But I just want to say that even if the person is not lynched very often, there was sexual assault against black women by mm -hmm. lynchers that sometimes was the reason mm -hmm. <laughs> for mm -hmm. the so-called dispute, right, mm -hmm. with the black man and whoever. Mm -hmm. um, and those just go unrecorded. Those are not recorded, right? Mm -hmm. Even as we're doing the recordings of lynching, we're mm -hmm. not recording those assaults. Um, uh, and sexual assaults on black women. And so you should assume, you know, that for a large portion of the, those statistical lynch lynchings that we look at, mm -hmm. that there is a story about an assault on black women somewhere in there. I also want to make sure that I once again call the name of Ida B. Wells Barnett, who, who um, was a journalist, was a journalist. We talk about courage, the courage of this woman to um, do investigations of lynching. I mean, she would travel to the mm -hmm. place and interview people and write about these lynchings and to keep a running list. Um, she herself had to flee. She was born in Holly Springs, Mississippi, but then lived in Memphis. She had three very close friends who were um, grocers. They were, owned a grocery store. Um, and the grocery store was too successful and the local whites became jealous of them and lynched these three men who were her close friends. And she had to flee Memphis, which is how she left um, Memphis, Tennessee. Um, that kind of terror that mm -hmm. women live with, right, when their families were lynched, um, many lynching accounts I've read of women who, um, and I think I referenced this earlier, were afraid to come and go and collect the body of their, of their loved one who was lynched because of the threats that were coming to their family, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, who wanted to, trying desperately to find a way to get out of town, trying to, uh, trying to find a way to protect their sons if the father was lynched, fearing that the lynchers would come for the son. Um, the, the, the terrorism of this surrounded the family, and in particular, women had to confront that, that aftermath. Remember, when we're talking about terror, we're not just talking about the event. We're talking about the message sent by the event and who has to then live with that message and who lives in that fear. And this was often black women. Mm -hmm. And when we look at this issue today, when we look at what happened to Sandra Bland, uh, when we look at what that, that video that we saw in the Waffle House, mm -hmm. I'll take this all the way back to Eleanor Bumpers in New York, Eleanor the grandmother Bumpers who was right. killed. Yeah. Um, there is a, it is part of a connected narrative about who black women are in our mm -hmm. society and I'm about an attempt to assign a particular kind of story to black women. Mm -hmm. um, and those encounters, the, re the reason that they are so deeply painful to watch is that they, there is an acting out of a historic narrative about men and are and how you are, how white supremacy must dominate black mm -hmm. women, must dominate their voices, must dominate their bodies, mm -hmm. must dominate their freedom, must suggest that they do not carry within them the kind of compassion and love and tenderness that has been the narrative associated with white women. I mean, it is all being acted out in these moments. And we, if we're not careful, if we don't say her name, if we don't, if we don't talk mm -hmm. about this issue, we're part of 
of that as well. And we, we can be complicit yes. in, um, in carrying forward that story as though the struggle of black women does not rise to the level of the struggle, struggle of black men. Um, and as though black women, even, even when we, we get into the, you know, black women are so tough, we're the t you know, we tell all these wonderful stories about ourselves, which, is, which, are, which are true, doesn't change the, the tenderness, doesn't change the vulnerability, doesn't change the ways in which we are victims also. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be willing to give up a little bit of the fierceness, you know, trope mm -hmm. <laughs> to acknowledge that we are whole people and it comes with all of those pieces. And the story of white supremacy has assigned a particular narrative to black women that it is our job to interrupt and upend in this rebirth mm -hmm. that you're talking about. We have the ability to do that, and we should do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. You know, the story that Brian told last night, and I'm forgetting her name, the woman who was 109 years old on stage last night who had to flee uh, white racial terrorism mm -hmm. over and over again, fleeing one town after another. Um, it reminds me of all of the work that women continue to do. Um, today in the age of mass criminalization, to try to keep their families safe. Um, you know, it was striking to me, looking at the numbers of people who were lynched in the South, the overwhelming majority are men. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's easy to mm -hmm. kind of say, well, it wasn't that big of a problem mm -hmm. for women. Well, not only were women lynched, but mm -hmm. they were the ones who had to deal with the fallout mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. of the lynching and struggle to survive and to keep their families safe. And today, the overwhelming majority of people who are locked up are men, which has made it easy for scholars like me to focus primarily on the experience of black men. Um, but the reality is, is that black women are equally impacted mm -hmm by the crisis of mass criminalization. They're just impacted differently. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I am deeply inspired by, you know, formerly incarcerated women who have been doing heroic work, organizing, like Susan Burton and others, kind of organizing to ensure that women returning home from prison are provided the support um, that they need in order to make the rough transition, but there's also, you know, women like Gina Clayton, who has launched SE Justice Group, which is a phenomenal organization dedicated to supporting women who, you know, are dealing with the trauma, the fear, the economic anxiety associated with um, supporting and loving people who are behind bars. And uh, the experience of women um, in the age of lynching, in the age of mass criminalization is one that, you know, I believe has received far less attention than it deserves, mm -hmm. including from people like me. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope mm -hmm. that we're at a moment now, thanks to the work of Kimberly Crenshaw mm -hmm. and <laughs> many others, of understanding that we can no longer go forward talking about these issues in anything but a deeply intersectional way. Mm. We're uh, just about at the end of our time, but I think uh, it... <laughs> Y'all get William Barber next. Y'all cannot possibly be upset. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's safe to say that uh, there were never any individuals lynched, that there were individuals killed, but there were always entire communities that were the victims of the lynching. Mm -hmm. And our understanding of the ripple effects of those actions that come all the way down to the present is integral to our understanding of the problems we have right now mm -hmm. and where we go from here. Lynching and mob violence in this country, the, the roots of it go deeper than the country's roots itself. It goes back prior to 1776, mm -hmm. prior to the revolts against the British crown. And the organized regime 
of rape and violence that was slavery gave itself over to the, uh, it outsourced that violence to community members in order to reinforce the subordination of black people in that year where Tuskegee notes, I think it's 1882, where they say the first year that the number of black people lynched outnumber the number of white people, and then it proceeds to skyrocket from there. And the implications of that steady drip mm -hmm. of terrorism mm -hmm. over those decades. And the historian Rayford Logan referred to this as the, those years as the nadir. Mm -hmm the lowest point that came after slavery. Mm -hmm. There's lynching, there's the institutionalization of segregation, uh, there's the uh, creation of the sharecropping system. Uh, there are all these mechanisms, the revocation of the right uh, to vote, uh, the mechanisms that were intended to produce a new form of slavery in place of the one that had been defeated in the Civil War. And I've always had a question about that, the uh, idea of referring to it as the nadir. Because when I look at those years, I think of them as the Ida B. Well years. I think of them as the years in which the NAACP and the National Urban League were established. I think about those as the years in which W.E.B. Du Bois did some of his most important work. I think of those as the years where the black fraternities and sororities came into existence with their social justice mission to uplift black communities. And I think that that is why it's important to understand EJI in the context of that. Mm -hmm. That is, in the midst of our worst times and our biggest challenges, mm -hmm. that our greatest champions and our greatest heroes have done their most important work. And so, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Whatever the piss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's.